Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us on this cloudy day here in Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Sally, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so pleased to introduce this event with Pizzata Rang presenting her new book, Ma and Me, a memoir. She will be joined in conversation by Meghna Chakravarti. Thank you for joining us virtually this evening. Harvard Bookstore's event series continues both in person and virtually this spring, bringing authors and their work to our community and our digital community. Find our event schedule at harvard.com events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and shop our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event also has auto-generated closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. You can disable captions there as well. In the chat in just a moment, I'll be posting a link to purchase Ma and Me on harvard.com. Your purchases truly make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you all for tuning in and purchasing books from Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. Pizzata Rang is an author and a journalist whose writings have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and the Seattle Times, among other publications. Born in Cambodia and raised in rural Oregon, Rang has lived and worked in more than a dozen countries, including Cambodia, Afghanistan, and Thailand. She teaches memoir writing at the University of Washington School of Professional and Continuing Education. Meghna Chakrabarti is an American journalist and radio producer based in Boston. She is the host of NPR's On Point and is the former host of Radio Boston, WBUR's acclaimed weekday show with a focus on news. They'll be discussing Pizzata's new book, Ma and Me, a memoir. Within this book, she explores the long legacy of inherited trauma and the crushing weight of cultural and filial duty. Luang Ung, author of the First They Killed My Father, called this book lyrical, emotional, and profoundly moving. It is in equal parts a love story between a mother and her daughter and a family's tale of survival, war, and inherited traumas. We are so pleased to be hosting this event tonight. The digital podium is yours, Put and Megna. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much, Sally. It is always a profound pleasure to be able to participate in any uh, event or activity with Harvard Bookstore, uh, one of our absolute favorite local bookstores here in the greater Boston area. So definitely do what Sally recommended and buy from Harvard Bookstore because we need independent booksellers more than ever. Uh, so I have to say, as uh, a person who gets to interview all manner of remarkable human beings, the, the woman you're about to hear from is one of the most remarkable uh, I have ever known and met. And I have full disclosure here, if you didn't already know, uh, Put and I actually grew up in that same Oregon town. Um, so we go way back, actually, with a, with a large multi-decade um, uh, divergence in, in our paths. So it's a remarkable book, book and um, her willingness to share her story brought us back together again as well. And so I'm just so happy that you asked me put to uh, to guide guide us in conversation tonight. So let me just tell you, welcome to this space. Welcome to this Harvard Bookstore event and, and say hello to, to Cambridge and Greater Boston. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Megna. What a beautiful introduction. And um, thank you, Sally, for for having us this evening. This is this is so fantastic. Um, so um, grateful to all of you who are joining in tonight, tuning in from all parts of the U.S. and and perhaps uh, all you know various parts of the world as well. Uh, I have to say it was just an incredible, thrilling luck when I moved back to the U.S. from working as a journalist abroad, uh, and I moved back to uh, Seattle, Washington, to be with my partner. We were driving on Interstate Five one day and had the radio on, and when we turned it on, I heard this voice. It was just this sultry, deep, beautiful voice that I remembered from my youth. And an emotion caught in me. And I turned to my 
partner who became my wife. And I said, that's Meghna Chakrabarti, my friend from high school. And I remember telling her, wouldn't that be something if I ever wrote a story one day? And Meghna and I got a chance to talk to each other. And here we are indeed. So um, I thought <laughs> that would be crazy. Well, crazy things do happen, it turns out. Well, when you were describing that voice, I was thinking, yes, and Terry Gross never sounded so good, <laughs> even after being on the radio for decades. But thank you, Put, really. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm moved. I really am. Uh, but we're here to talk about you uh, and your remarkable, truly remarkable memoir. Um, Sally read some of the accolades that you've been receiving. Let me just uh, offer a few more from reviewers and people who have already had the chance to um, to, to read the book and have their lives graced by your story. It's been called everything from a memoir, a memoir of personal reckoning uh, about transnational identity, intergenerational trauma, survivor's guilt, and what we really owe to those that we love and what we owe ourselves. We'll talk about that a little bit. A, bo a book both of light, full of light and sadness, a wonder holding life's beauty and heartbreak in tandem, and a nuanced meditation on love, identity, and belonging. The story of survival radiates with resilience and hope. So just a few of the accolades that Ma and me have so richly deserved. Let me just first ask you, um, you know, give us the little, the, in, in a nutshell, what is the story that you're trying to tell in this memoir? I really started with a question um, that you raised and that others have raised in some of the, um, the uh, pre-publicity -pub reviews, which is this question of, do we owe anything to our mothers because they gave us life? Um, and in my particular case, there was uh, an extra complicating factor uh, that got added on to that question, which was, do I owe anything to the woman who not only gave me life, but to the woman who saved my life. Because in my story, my family fled the war and genocide in Cambodia in 1975, and we were thrust out to sea for 23 days. I was not quite one years old, I was a baby. And uh, I almost died on the boat. Uh, the captain of the ship had actually thought I was already dead and, and um, insisted to my mother that she throw me overboard because he worried that a corpse would contaminate this already overcrowded vessel filled with refugees from Cambodia trying to flee the genocide. And it was, in hindsight, I think my mother's greatest act of love to refuse to do what the captain said. But in that moment, something in me, when my mother told me the story, I understood that moment was so important something crystallized, which was this bond between my mother and I that was unbreakable, I believed until down the line when I became an adult and one thing did end up, end up breaking that bond. Um, and we'll definitely talk uh, about what that thing is. And by the way, before we go any further, um, I just wanna apologize to you put and to everyone watching, as you can see, I am in my sixth grade daughter's bedroom. <laughs> Um, so uh, that that's uh, the been the location for the past two years of my, of all virtual activities uh, in in this home, and uh, we live in very tight confines here. So if the noise level behind the door above me rises every now and then, I ask for your forgiveness in advance. Um, but before we talk more about the story that you tell, um, I wanted to ask you as a writer about the importance of stories, right? Because they are, they're, they're vessels for so much. And particularly in the lives of immigrant families, the stories oftentimes are all that those families truly have that they brought over from the place in the case of refugees that they were forced to flee. Um, so they carry a lot of weight. Um, and because of that, they're both treasured and uh, fragile. And I wondered about this particular, you know, story from of the many stories that your family has. Was it is it something that that your mother wanted to freely share because it was so important um, for her to to glue the family together and use the story as that glue, or was it something that she wanted to protect because of its preciousness? I think it's 
the latter. I think she really wanted to protect that story. And it's something, you know, when I think about it, she told me that story when I was very young. And it occurred to me, I, I can't remember if I had asked her as, as young children often do, wanting to know their origin story. We all get to an age where we have this deep curiosity of trying to figure out why we're on this earth. How did we get here? Where did we come from? And over the years, as my mom was telling the story, and as I've, as I've talked to my siblings as well, she consistently told me, and she told me over and over again, to the point where it just became part of me and, and became ingrained in my bones. And, and I believe she told it to protect the relationship of us because she understood that there was something significant about a mother and her baby girl. I don't think that that's specific to my mom and I. I, I see that in, in my friends and their families as well, um, who, are, who are babies of their families. You know, the baby always has a certain, holds a certain particular place in, in the mother's heart. Um, and in this particular case, it was two things, my mom wanting to protect the story, but also wanting to protect me, wanting me to know that you were so close to dying as a way of, of encouraging me to do everything I could to live and to thrive. That's a, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't, I really hadn't thought about it that way. So that's both a, it, it's like an incredible source of inspiration and energy. And I mean, because of the way you frame what the central, one of the central questions is in the book, um, did it feel like, did that knowledge feel like, um, I don't want to say the word burden, uh, but you used the word, I mean, that it, that it became this, this sense of this debt that you owe. Right, right. I, I have a hard time using the word burden too, because I, 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 I use the word albatross in the book, and I feel like that's a little bit more close to, to what the feeling is. Um, it's, it's weighty. It's definitely weighty. Um, but there are two sides to that coin. It's weighty, but it's also the thing that, that propels me and motivates me and sort of, you know, girds my, my every actions um, to succeed in, the, in this life. And succeed I have done, I have just pushed myself my entire life to get where I am. Um, but this idea of, of the role of stories, I think it's something that's so universal and, and, and unites us so much. And what I realized after working on this memoir is that stories have the ability to both set us free, but also to contain us and, and to keep us imprisoned by uh, the parameters of what that story is. And so in, in writing this book, for me personally, one of my attempts was hoping that I could write my way out of a narrative that for so long I was trapped in, which was the narrative of the weakling on the boat that almost died. I wanted to be anything but that. So can you tell me more then about, um, I, I imagine that that desire predated your, your desire to, to write this memoir, right? Right. So, so can you tell me more about that, about how when you were, when you were growing up, the knowledge of uh, of the story of um, the harrowing journey that your mother and family had to take and you took. I mean, how did that um, inform the actions of that you chose and maybe even the actions that you didn't chose? Like, you know, yeah. like just how you moved through space. Right, right. Oh, I have some clear examples of how that manifested. Um, when I got a bicycle, um, uh, my, my mom and dad dragged it home from a garage sale in our neighborhood. And, and um, I was in kindergarten, I just fell in love with it. That little bicycle became my freedom. And I learned to ride it immediately when they dragged it home. And what I ended up doing was, even though my mom said, you can ride in the driveway, you can ride to the end of the block. Well, being the rebel child I was and <laughs> pushing my limits, I rode down to the 7-Eleven, I rode over to Wilson Elementary School in Corvallis, you know, way, way beyond. Um, that one block radius that my mom allowed me to go. And, and it was, I understood and looking back, of course, back then, I just thought I was being a rebel, but, but from this vantage point, looking back, I, I realized what it was. I was pushing myself. I was constantly pushing myself to go explore, to go do things on my own and to try to be independent and, and to try to try to claim something for myself. As it was as if I was trying to prove that I could be alone and I could find my way in the world alone with this, you know, tiny little uh, banana seat bike and little put, you know, go, going down to the 7-Eleven. Um, and then it, and then again, um, 
you know, through high school, um, just pushing myself uh, to excel in academics. You know, my, my parents, um, you know, of course, we could talk, we could speak about this, the idea of the model minority and, and, um, and my parents indeed pushed me to, to do well in school as well. It, they weren't overbearing about it. I think their attitude about education had always been that at least if you can graduate high school, you can go on and, and do a job that, that's not like our job. At the time, my mom was a janitor and my dad was washing dishes at a restaurant. And um, so there's this idea that I, I've been constantly trying to push myself to succeed and to prove that I'm strong and to prove that I'm worthy. All of that originated from and was seeded by that story of that baby in the boat. So I actually think we should talk more about, about your mom and, and, and your dad, but per, obviously particularly your mother, because um, as you describe her in the book before, long before having to, um, to flee the, the ravages of the Khmer Rouge. She was already, um, a, you know, an unusual woman for her time and place. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, she was. I often think about my mom as, there are people who I, I think are born way beyond their time. And my mom was indeed one of them. She got, she was a village girl who grew up um, relatively poor because her father who was a school teacher gambled his his earnings as a school teacher away and and her mom um, tended the the family's rice paddies and um, but when she was very young her uncle took her with him to um, to Gao provincial town which is south of the capital of Cambodia Phnom Penh um, to, to live with him and to go to school so by by virtue of her her uncle taking her to get an education that completely changed her life because girls back then, you know, 1960s Cambodia, weren't meant to get an education. The classroom was a, the domain of boys. Well, when she got an education, that meant that she learned how to think critically. Um, she excelled in math. She had dreams, which was unusual for my girls. And my mother had a specific dream. She wanted to be a businesswoman. And when she told me about that, at one point, my heart broke for her because I thought, my gosh, if things had been different, she would have been able to live her dream. Well, that didn't happen. She learned after graduating college that um, her father planned to corral her into an arranged marriage and she didn't want to get married. So she fled. She did the most controversial, scandalous thing a young Khmer woman would do. She, she ran away rather than get married. When I think about that, and I think about my own life, I think, my, my goodness, she and I are so much alike, even though I have spent my entire life railing about how different I am from her. But in fact, the opposite is true. Wow. Um, I want to take a little uh, sidebar here for a second. Um, and then we'll re refocus back on on the story you tell in your memoir. It just suddenly occurred to me. So your family had to flee uh, Cambodia uh, and part of the, the political situation that they were fleeing was the result of actions taken by the United States, right? Because of the you know, we found out many decades later, the deliberate expansion of uh, the war in Vietnam into Cambodia, right? The US government knew what it was doing when it started dropping bombs um, beyond the Vietnam-Cambodia border. That of course is one of the pieces of the puzzle that led to the, um, thereafter the genocide perpetrated by the Khmer Rouge. And then your, and then your family had to, you know, ha became refugees from their, their homes, their, their nation, and came to the United States. I wonder what you think about that, right? That, that, you, that your family ended up in the country that was partially responsible for the need to have fled Cambodia in the first place. Right. Well, it certainly complicates my feelings about being American. When I was growing up in Corvallis and up until age 16, which was the first time that I went to Cambodia, I didn't know I was anything other than American. 
I loved pepperoni pizza from Domino's when we, our mom let us order it. And at school, you know, it was just eating nachos from the cafeteria, just like everybody else. I didn't know that there was this other side of me because my parents never really spoke about Cambodia. My mom told us folk tales when we were growing up, but folk tales are different from one's true life story and experiences. And she never told us about what her life was like, or my father never talked about his life. And so I, I, I sort of was marinating in, in folk tales about this, this other world, not making the connection that that other world was indeed mine. And so I grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I grew up feeling very um, patriotic. I will say that word because I still am patriotic. And, um, but when I began to research my memoir and I learned about the secret bombing of my country, that was the moment that something shifted in me. Um, I'll be honest, uh, there was a period of deep grief and mourning about that because everything I understood about who I was an American, um, I really had to suddenly question that. And, and I, it, was, it was so hard to reconcile this feeling of, my God, I'm in this country because America was in my country first, dropping bombs. And in fact, my mother believes that her oldest brother who she loved and adored uh, died by U.S. bombing, even before the genocide happened. That's, that's a hard reality to sit with. Um, if I remember correctly, your mother was even with her brother, right? Uh, for uh, when some of that bombing occurred, is she that was, right? 1968, when she decided when she heard that she was going to be in an arranged marriage and she thought, no way, there's no way I'm gonna do that, <laughs> hell no. And she fled. She didn't know that the Vietnam War was going on and where she ran away, she ran east toward the border with Vietnam because her brother taught um, in a province called Bray Wing province, which was really just miles from the Vietnam border, so close. And so in 1968, while she was there hiding, she experienced the B-52 bombs dropping from the sky. And, and how she describes it, it was just the most horrific, terrifying thing she'd ever experienced in her life. Um, so with that in mind, I'd love it if you could tell us the story you had just mentioned that uh, uh, you were 16 when you first went to Cambodia. Um, and, you know, just to add from, you know, my personal experience of my parents, as you know, put uh, immigrated from India, very different circumstances, uh, um, not refugees. But every time I went back to India with my parents, and particularly my mother, actually, uh, I saw a different woman. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, you know, I'd love to hear you know, any story you'd like to tell about your, your impressions and your experience in the, on that first trip to Cambodia, but also who did you see? I mean, who was the woman that you saw uh, when you saw your mother also with you in Cambodia? Yeah. Right. I, I hadn't really thought about it that, that deeply. And, and, um, and thank you for the question, because the, the woman who I grew up with in America was the, a completely different woman of who I saw in Cambodia. And it was as if the mother who I was with traveling in Cambodia when I was 16 years old was a little girl again. She was laughing and enjoying time reuniting with her relatives and eating the fruits of her youth, you know, lychees and rambutans and all this incredible food. I had never seen her laugh more and enjoy herself more than when she was in Cambodia for the first time after leaving. Um, we left in 1975, and the very first return back was 1990. And I and I and I want to backtrack a little bit to say what prompted that return specifically in 1990, which is that when the war and genocide in Cambodia ended in 1979, after four brutal years, two million deaths. My parents, and I'll never forget this because I was the one that often got the mail when I got home from school. They would get these blue Airmail Express envelopes postmarked Thailand from refugee camps. And what it, the, the senders were my relatives who had survived the genocide, reaching out to my parents. And my mom 
what she told me not too long ago, actually, I, I'd already finished writing the last draft of this book and she still had more stories to tell me. She said, you kids didn't know anything. We tried to get you to come sit in the family room to read you these letters and you didn't care. And, and that really hurt me because I don't even remember what the significance of these letters were. I knew that they made my mother cry, but there was that disconnect again because I didn't know what Cambodia was. And after a while, and after so many letters of relatives enumerating other relatives who had died during the genocide, my mom in 1990 finally decided, that's it, I wanna go home. I wanna see for myself who's still alive and who's not. She took me with her because she said I was too young to have memories of my own when we fled Cambodia. And so that's how I got to go. When we got there, I will say um, it was bittersweet because while she was so excited to be back on her in her homeland again, the stories that she heard from her sisters and her cousins and her uncle about how they survived the genocide had her just crying. So it was this really, it was this really odd moment for me to see my mother laughing and enjoying her time with her relatives on the one hand, and then in deep distress at night on the other, having heard their stories. So refugees undergo a forced deracination, essentially, right? I mean, literally, physically, culturally, emotionally, mentally, they are torn away from th their roots. And in a sense, new roots take hold through their children. And so this brings us back to the question that you ask in, in, in the memoir, Ma and Me, about like, what do you, what do you owe <laughs> um, to the woman who's your mother and, and who saved your life? Because I think very, very much in your case, um, and in the case of many immigrant families and refugee families, there, there, there is a sense that um, our, our children will move forward in a way that we could not. So with that in mind, the question comes to a very sharp relief in your life when you were, your life was propelling you in a direction uh, regarding who you are and who you love that wasn't necessarily what uh, your mother in particular might have expected. So tell us, tell me how that, that question started percolating uh, in your mind and what led you to finally make the decision to, to, to come out to, to your mother? Yeah, well, let me just say for full transparency, because I never said this in high school or any time before, even though I knew I was gay. I knew since I was very young that I felt differently about girls than I did about boys. I was absolutely terrified, both within my own family and within Corvallis. You know, Corvallis is, you know, it can be pretty conservative too, where we grew up in Oregon. And so there are a couple layers of being terrified about being who I was um, in my own family and in my own community. And so I really just showed it as far deep inside of me as I could. Um, but you know, you can, you can only hold on to a secret for so long and keep yourself imprisoned for so long. I grew up in a, in a family in a context where my mom told me, or not since I was a very little girl, when you grow up, your duty and your job is to have a hot meal for your husband when he gets home. I heard that over and over again. It was my mother's mantra. And then it became mine. And that's what I thought my life was going to be. I was going to grow up, have a husband and have, you know, hot meals ready for him, <laughs> ready to go. He didn't have to lift a finger. And um, that began to get harder and harder the older I got. And when I got into my early 20s and I met a woman who became my first girlfriend, fell in love. It was, it was a deeply disorienting and unsettling moment in my life because I felt this absolute love for another person, but that person was female. And my mom had told me I was going to have a husband. Um, there was never an idea or a, you know, an option that I was ever going to have a wife. Um, and so I kept fighting that impulse, which is not really an impulse. It's just who I am. I kept, I kept fighting myself. I knew I was gay, but I kept fighting that identity, that piece of me, up until the point when 
Um, I had had this incredible career as a journalist here in the US working for various newspapers and ended up moving abroad. And there was a moment when I moved abroad to work as a journalist, specifically training reporters in conflict zones, in, in both war zones and post-conflict zones. Um, I thought, maybe I never have to go back to the US again. I like my life abroad. But then life steps in the way, um, you know, life steps in in unusual um, and unexpected ways. And I ended up visiting Seattle, visiting my sisters, and I met the woman who would become my wife. When I met her, that's when I knew my life was just going to change completely because she was someone who I would, who I realized there were two different types of love at play here, the love for my mother versus the love for this woman who would become my wife. And I realized I'd given my mom so much of me and everything that I did was for her, all the grades, the career, anytime I got an award, I put it into her hands. I realized I need to start living for me. And that was when the American, the very American part of me came out again. That was when I turned 40 and I met my wife. So there's a lot I want to ask you um, in a minute about the act of writing this memoir. But give us, don't give, a, don't give away too much because we want people to read the book. <laughs> um, right. but, but it's just because this question that you ask about what do you owe is so powerful and um, and sort of the the hard won answers are what you explore in part of the book. Obviously it caused, when you did come out to your mother, it caused a rift to say the least. Um, so just tell me a little bit about that and um, and and what, or what or how did you know that the rift could be closed? Yeah, you know, I should back up and say that I actually did come out to my mom in my early 20s. She was visiting me in California where I was working at the San Jose Mercury News at the time. And I invited her to come down for the weekend. And that was the weekend that I told myself, you have to be straight with her. You have to tell her who you are. And I did. And how she reacted stunned me. Um, we were sitting on the sofa in my apartment in Oakland. And I told her, I, I said, I'm gay. And we started to cry. It was the very first time in my life that my mom said, I love you. And I thought, oh, we're going to be fine. She gets it. She accepts me. But just to be sure, because I wasn't sure she, even she knew what the word gay was, I drove her across the Bay Bridge to the Castro in San Francisco. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I wanted her to like, see, like, this is, this is my community. This is who I am. And I'll never forget, you know, she, she, she pushed her cheek to the, to the window. She was just absolutely stunned. She'd never seen a, a gay neighborhood before. And she was pointing at these two guys holding hands and she's telling me, put, put that the gay. I was like, yes, mom, that's the gay. Put your hand down. What are you doing? <laughs> so embarrassed. And, and then I understood, you know, she knows what the word gay means. There's no mistake. But between my 20s and the, by the time I met my wife, um, I think that in hindsight, my mom perhaps held on to this idea that I would grow out of my gayness, that eventually I would return to my senses and meet a man and marry a man. And that didn't happen. The point at which I made the decision to get married was when it became real for my mother that this had never been a phase at all, in fact. And there was something very brutal about, for my mom, about the fact that she had a gay daughter because our culture is so conservative. And specifically for a Cambodian mother, a, a Cambodian mother's greatest moment is when her daughter gets married because then she knows she did the very best job as a mother. So, so who I was as a person and who I was going to marry was intricately linked to her own identity as a mother. Those two things could not be cleaved. So when I did announce to my parents that I was going to marry April, my wife, it was the very first time that our bond broke and it was brutal. You are so um, searingly honest in the memoir. Um, it's, it's both, it, it's painful 
beautiful, tender. Uh, I just, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around sort of what that process was like for you, putting all of this, these stories to paper. Um, did it cost you emotionally? It did. I almost quit more than once. Um, and, you know, I think, and, and you, you'll appreciate this as well, Megna, because you're, because you're a journalist. As a journalist, we focus on telling other people's stories, not our own. And suddenly when I found myself with a book deal in hand, but the project this time was me interviewing me and the, and the line of inquiry, you know, the buck really did stop with me this time. I wasn't used to that. So the first probably two or three drafts out of this, of this memoir um, were very repertorial, facts, figures, dates, um, it read very differently than, than what we have in our hands now. And I remember my editor, who was just fantastic, so patient and tender um, in guiding me along. She told me in those early years, it took four years to write this book. She said, "Put I, I want you to take off your reporter's hat and put on your writer's hat. And I thought, well, I'm only a reporter. I don't have the writer's hat. Where is it? Let <laughs> me buy one of those. Um, I had to learn as one does. And uh, it was over the- Can I just interject? I'm so sorry to interject, yeah, but I have to. Too. You have always been a writer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. There's no doubt that, that it, maybe you just like thought the hat was invisible, but you have All always right. been a writer oh. because the beauty of the language in the book is just astonishing. And that doesn't just happen if you're learning to write for the first time as you, as you yes. craft a memoir here. So I just wanted to say, do, okay. do not- do not underestimate yeah. yourself here. But I, did, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, no, not at all. That's so kind, Megna. I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, but, you know, for myself, I've always prided myself on the fact that I, I was a journalist. I could get, get all the facts right, get the truth out kind of thing. Uh, I want to talk about the two moments that I almost quit this project. Um, the first happened about two years in, and um, it had to do with being re-triggered over the course of putting these stories and emotions down and, and trying to manipulate the scenes so that they would make sense chronologically or figuring out the structure. To go backwards in your life to what I call pain points, um, it's not an easy thing to do. And you know, at the University of Washington where I teach memoir writing, where I, what I tell my students is that the work that we do as memoirists, you will be pushed to the outer edges of yourself. Um, and that certainly ha happened for me. Um, two years into this project, it was so painful for me um, to go back to revisit um, really tough points in my life where, um, you know, in my 20s, I was so, I, I felt so much agitation about being gay and I hadn't come out to anybody yet um, that, I was deeply depressed and that did lead to a suicide attempt. And those were the things that I had to reckon with. And those were the things that I had to, to, to decide whether or not to put into this book. Um, and I got over that piece of it, but then um, two years later, toward the end, a year ago this month, as I was rounding out the corner to the final draft, I was re-triggered once again when I was working on the chapter on Afghanistan and my experience there. And I wasn't expecting that to happen, but working on that chapter led to weeks and weeks of nightmares and waking up in the middle of the night with, you know, just sweaty and, and um, terrified. And um, it, was, it was a really stressful moment. Um, and the PTSD just came flaring back into my life. Um, but by then I was, I was so, close to the finish line. Um, so I kind of pushed myself through, but, but those two specific moments almost meant that this book didn't happen. And, and I guess what I will say one thing is for anybody out there in the audience who was working on a memoir, all I can say is give yourself a break, walk away from the story sometimes. Well, actually someone has a, a, a follow-up question to, to what you just said, because they, they, they say it looks, uh, 
it sounds like an excavation that you had to do to write the book. And it must have been very, very hard. Um, but you just said you pushed through some of those moments. But the person wants to know, how did you take care of yourself yeah. as you work through such traumatic memories? Right, right. Um, lots of long walks. And um, I like to say that I'm therapied up. Some people get lawyered up. Well, Pizarro Rain gets therapied up. So I've got my personal therapist. I've got a physical therapist. I've got my couples therapist. <laughs> so I'm like completely taken care of uh, on that front. Um, but in all seriousness, if it weren't for the fact that I have friends who paved the path of memoir writing before me, one in particular, Luang Ung, who wrote the gorgeous and haunting memoir, First They Killed My Father, about how she survived the genocide in Cambodia. Uh, she was my lifeline. She was my lifeline for the past four years. Anytime I hit this moment of just pure agony in the writing or even re-interviewing my mom to double check information, I would call Wong and we would talk for two hours about both the craft of writing, the pain of writing. She went through some very similar moments that I did where she just wondered was, is this worth it? Is, is it worth it for us as writers to put our pain onto the page in this way and for, to what end? I'm, I'm clear for me to what end, to what end is for my 10 nieces and nephews who I wrote the book for, but, but it's not easy. And the, and the question of self-care is so critical. And, and it's one of the things I talk to my students about too, is I cannot tell them when to walk away from their story and give themselves a break. That's a calibration that only they know. But what I will say is that if, if the story that you have is so important to tell, that you're gonna be willing to go through the agony of telling it, don't stop, don't stop. We need to hear that story. We need to hear your, your truth. Uh, another person wants to know more about what the, your research process you know, was, was like, what specifically did you do to, um, you know, to unearth uh, the stories and the memories and, and, you know, put it, and put it together. Specifically, I'll add this, in a memoir, um, because you had you had the option, you could have done a different type of book that That's wasn't a, you know a one hundred percent true um, telling of your story. Um, you could have tiptoed around uh, around some of it if you if you'd chosen. But but so anyway, I'm rambling. I apologize. First of all, what was your research process like? And then um, second of all, tell me a little bit more about why you chose memoir over. Um, if I remember the other uh, auto fiction would be the other one of the other options. That's right. Yeah, which would have been a super easy way out, yes. But let me address the research piece of it first. Uh, uh, my research involved mostly interviewing my parents, my aunties, being back in Cambodia, interviewing my relatives who had survived the war to hear, hear stories about my grandmother who, whose death predates the genocide, um, but who was a, 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 a strong influence in both my mother's life and mine vis-a-vis -vis the stories my mother told me. One of the things that was painful for me as a journalist working on this book is that my impulse and instinct will always be to find documents and records that prove what somebody has told me. That wasn't possible in my case because all of that was burned in the war. All of it was lost. Anything that I could find that, that even hinted at a record was from the perspective and from the place of the US. I went to, um, uh, to the Carter Library in Atlanta, I spent a lot of time there looking at correspondences um, between uh, the US and US Ambassador John Gunther Dean in the years leading up to the Khmer Rouge's ultimate takeover, just so that I could understand what that moment was like and what kind of, of um, sort of higher level political maneuverings were going on in my country that ultimately caused the, de the destabilization in Cambodia that forced my country, uh, forced my family to flee. And so to the extent that I could get records, they were records from the US. There were no records that I could get in Cambodia about my family or you know, birth certificates, death certificates. Um, those were all burned with the exception of the birth certificates um, that my father was able to, um, to put into his briefcase when we fled. I have my birth certificate. We have, um, my father um, was generous enough to share with me his wedding certificate. So I have probably four or five documents like that in our family, but 
when I think about these stories of people going into like ancestry.com and suddenly they have like all of these boxes filled with documents and whatnot, that's not my family. And, um, and there's a deep loss there. There's a deep loss there from a journalistic standpoint. Um, that also made it, made it even all the more difficult to choose to write memoir as opposed to auto fiction, um, a novel that, that included factual information or kind of tr true life information. Uh, but there's a, and, and I did play with the idea of maybe I should just write fiction. But ultimately I decided that the truth was more important for me. Something that my mom said to me over the course of several years of interviewing her was, but I don't know what's gonna happen um, to all these stories that I've told you in your brothers and sister. When I'm dead, the story ends. And what I would like to tell her is that the stories don't end. I'm gonna keep writing them, mom. What does she think about the book? She has not read it yet. <laughs> for starters she doesn't my, my mom doesn't read much English and when I when I presented her with an advanced review copy and she thumbed through it and the very first thing she said was oh these are a lot of words in here put <laughs> she said <laughs> no pictures no and she said it's going to take me 10 years to read this if I read one line per day which is <laughs> so that's kind of the slow rate at which she thinks she would be able to plod through. I recorded my own audiobook version and I and and my intention is to take it with me and sit with my parents and listen to every minute of the story as I am telling it and and explain to them because I will still have to explain some things to them um, of their own story. Um, they never, they never went to, you know, to study English when we got to America, they just started working right away. And so to the extent that my parents speak English and understand, they learned from watching Will of Fortune and Jeopardy. And that's kind of pretty much that, you know, where, where they got their English. Um, so I, one thing I will say about my mom is that uh, she's so proud of me. She's proud that I was able to work on you know, this project. She actually did come to my book launch at Powell's Bookstore in Portland. And she didn't really understand what all the fuss was about. She's like, so what a book, you know? And, and it was the first time she'd actually been inside a bookstore, which was amazing to me. Um, and I thought, gosh, if, if me writing a book is the thing that will get my parents to enter a bookstore, then I should better write another one here pretty soon because books are important. Um, but yeah. We'll see. Check back in with me in a couple months when I when they've had a chance to digest the story via the audiobook. Yeah, we'll see. If, we'll see if what this does is uh, I get myself um, basically um, kicked out of the family once more. First time for being gay. Second time for writing about being gay in a Cambodian family. <laughs> I'm ready. Um, well, uh, I hope that does not happen. I'm going to trust that it will not happen. Um, but. Uh, uh, oh, this is another great question that's come in from Nell, Nell Pepper, who says, uh, what books or other media did you pull insp inspiration from? Uh, throughout this talk, I keep thinking about Ocean Vuong's line, thus no bombs, no equals no family equals no me, yikes. So that's the first part of Nell's question. And then Nell also wants to know, what are you reading now? Yeah, um, I have what I call my book Bibles. And in that collection would be Hisham Matar's The Return, a memoir about uh, the author making the decision to go back to Libya to see if his father, who was a political dissident, arrested under Gaddafi's regime is still alive. It struck me to my core. It has, uh, uh, my story and Hisham Matar's story could not be further apart. However, there are threads of similarity there. And so that really gave me so much inspiration because his story was so painful to read and I imagine so painful to write. And I thought, my gosh, if he could do it, then I certainly can try to do it as well. And then the other book was actually um, The Color of Water, James McBride, where um, James McBride interviews his mother and, and where I got the inspiration to let my mother speak in her own words, which appears in my book as italics. And those are verbatim words from interviews I did with my mother. Uh, I got that idea from James McBride and borrowed that because it was so effective in his book. And I hope that it is effective in mine as well. Um, what I'm reading right now is that, uh, or excuse me, is um, 
uh, well, I will say just very recently, I read Albert Samaha's Memoir Concepcion, which is just phenomenal. Highly recommend that. And um, now that I'm done with my memoir, and I and I had only been on a diet of reading memoirs up until this point, I'm gonna I'm I'm determined to go back into fiction as well. So I don't have anything on my on my nightstand right now. I'm taking a little bit, a bit of a break, but I'm gonna go in the direction of fiction very soon. Um, and uh, we do have one more question, but I'm gonna hold it till the end. So Rachel, I will ask your question. I promise. It's just such a wonderful one. I want it to be our our closing thought. Okay. Um, you know, you said you started writing the memoir, started working on the project four years ago, you said. Right. So one can never know the world in which a work lands in. Uh, when you start, you, you don't know what the world's gonna be like uh, when you complete the project. And it just so happens uh, that in those four years, obviously there's been a lot. <laughs> um, and in a sense, the, I mean, the pandemic being, I suppose, the biggest one, but now at this moment, maybe not the most urgent one, because we find ourselves in a world where, um, you know, thinking about the themes that you, you explore in the book, right now in the United States, we have uh, this just vicious uh, surge of everything from the belief in so-called great replacement theory, right? To the, um, the, the rise of almost instantaneous, they're not instantaneous, they've been hovering under the surface, but now uh, codified you know, laws seeking to, to remove the, the, the rights of uh, members of the LGBTQ community uh, in various states across the country. We have a rise in um, anti-Asian and anti-Asian American sentiment and and violence. Um, uh, we also have, uh, as always in various parts of the world, um, the ma mass migration of, of human beings, uh, including refugees, most recently in Ukraine. Um, I, I only point that out because these are all things that, like, you're, you have, you're, you, they are, they flow through your life. Yep. And what is it, so what does it feel like now to, to bring this book into, into the world at this moment? It's a, it's a really heavy feeling. I, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, this very fact that it seems that every piece of who I am is under attack in my own country right now. Being female, the potential, the, it's looking like the, uh, the actual repeal of Roe v. Wade, um, being gay, this, uh, don't say gay ban um, and uh, the um, book bans that are happening, being Asian and the increase in violence, particularly against Asian American women. It's making me think of what it means to be American. And that pride I felt as a little kid growing up in Corvallis, saying the Pledge of Allegiance is suddenly being undermined by where we are in this specific moment in our country. I'm still so proud to be American, and I will say that. I will, I believe I, you know, I will always say that because I have been in other countries where we don't have the same freedoms, and where as a journalist, I would have to watch my back if I wrote particular stories. I don't have to watch my back if I write a story um, about a controversy in finance and government here or or you know about anything really. I don't have the fear as a journalist here in America as I would in other countries. And so there are, I think that there are some really important values we have as Americans, but more and more I'm beginning to question what it is and who I am as an American within this context, because I had believed as I was working on this book, when it came out, as it is right now, that I should be proud of all these different pieces of who I am. But then now suddenly I'm, suddenly I'm in a country and, and, I, and I'm in a position and in a moment of time that we are going through this reckoning, that there are indeed many Americans who don't approve of who I am as an American. And that's, and that's really a bitter pill to swallow. Uh, but to be clear, I mean, I, I believe that you have every right. And in fact, I will say for yourself and for the rest of us, I want you to remain proud of who you are, right? Because the distinction is you can, be, you can remain 
proud of yourself as Putrang, the complex, integrated, multi-identified American, and at the same time, not feel so proud of the country that forms part of that identity. I, that's, that's how I look at it right now from regarding what I, you know, what I think of myself, also a very proud and patriotic American. I will say that too, looking around me and thinking, um, there's much work to be done. That's right. So um, two more questions, and then we're gonna wrap up. Uh, first of all, we have focused quite a bit on um, the trauma and the difficulties, the sadness, um, uh, and the, the challenges that you explore uh, in the memoir and, and all of those things that you had to experience while writing it. I want, I'm wondering if there's another side to that coin though. Did the opportunity to write the memoir also give you like, in, in fact, almost joyful insights or a sense of relief about any part of your life or, uh, or your relationship with your mother? It did. It, you know, some of the memories uh, that I'll call up are in my youth growing up with my siblings. And as to the extent that I write about how hard our lives were picking strawberries and blueberries and Corvallis, in and around Corvallis, up and down the Willamette Valley, there was joy there too. And as hard as that was, I would never give up that tenderness and those tender memories for anything. And the other piece of it too was because of writing this book, I got to experience, um, I, I didn't take just one trip back to Cambodia with my mother, but in, indeed I took um, several different trips. And in those moments, I got to experience her joy. I sometimes wondered whether she would have wanted to just stay in Cambodia, but her life was in America now. But to have those moments of just seeing my mother with her pure joy, those, those moments stay with me. Um, okay, so here's the last question. I just love it so much. Uh, Rachel Haig wants to know, she says, we are wondering if there are plans for a delicious Ma and Me cookbook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there may be, in fact. Uh, you know, my editor, would, as she was reading various drafts of the book, Every time she would write me back, she would say, I always get so hungry after I read your book. <laughs> but after, and um, I got hungry just, just writing it. My oldest sister, you know, I think in my family, my siblings were the keeper of, of different kinds of records. My oldest sister had, has taken it upon herself to gather, collect um, my mother's recipes for different Cambodian foods. And she actually asked me, she said, why don't, we, why don't we put this out there um, for people? Mom's food is amazing, which it is. And I know that I'm biased, but other people have eaten her food and have said the same thing, that it's, it's pretty delicious. So, you know, when I think about it, that would be a fantastic follow-on to, uh, to a book that, it, that is rather heavy. There, there are some light moments in my memoir, but, uh, but I will be honest, um, there are very intense moments as well. So a cookbook seems to be right, right along my pace for a follow-up if I were to do any other book after this. Also, uh, food and family recipes are a form of those stories that will not end. That's right. That will not stop as, as you've so beautifully promised. So I hope so. I hope that a cookbook comes up because I would love to know some of your mother's recipes. I would. Um, so put, we're out of time. Uh, and I just want to say congratulations, first of all. Um, I, I do think that your book is going to end up in sort of the canon of, of, of important stories. I don't know if I should, what do you want to call it? Like an immigrant story, a refugee story, American story, but whatever you want to call it, it's going to end up as a key part of, uh, of that canon. So congratulations on having written the book. It is so wonderful to actually see you. Um, as I said, we grew up together. We graduated, we went to the same elementary school, middle school and high school, but graduated a year before I did. Um, we went our separate ways, but what a gift you've given us all by telling your story and particularly me um, and reconnecting with me. So put, thank you so much. And I cannot wait to see what you do next. Oh, thank you so much, Megan. This was an incredible honor and joy to be in conversation with you about this. And also thank you to Harvard Bookstore. Please do get this book directly from Harvard Bookstore if you if you choose to get it. And if what we've said here is interesting to you. Yes, I will put that link 
again in the chat if you would like to purchase the book from Harvard Bookstore. Um, thank you, Put, and thank you, Magna, so much for this conversation. It was sad and heartbreaking and wonderful all at the same time to listen to your stories. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us this evening. Um, Thank you for spending your evening with us. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keep reading and have a great evening. Good night, everybody.